Good evening, and welcome to my stream. I am the queer, Christian, and narco-communist. On this show I read what I hope is easy to understand theory. That is, things smart people wrote, that explains how the world works, why it sucks for workers, people of color, disabled people, queer people, the poor, and basically everyone who isn't a rich, white, cishet man, from the point of view that God is on the side of the poor. The point is to spur all of us on to take action. As Karl Marx said, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. If we workers want to emancipate ourselves, we can't do that by listening to streams but, or giving money to self-proclaimed leftists on Patreon. We need to do the work of bringing to birth a new world from the ashes of the old. To that end, there are several organizations that need our time, talent, money, and effort. In particular, I want to signal boost Food Not Bombs, the Black Rose Anarchist Federation, the John Brown Gun Club, Socialist Rifle Association, and the Industrial Workers of the World. I strongly support the IWW in particular because it is my union, and I believe in its mission as an organization of, by, and for the working class. And so I want to begin this and each stream by reading part of the preamble to the IWW Constitution. The working class and the employing class have nothing in common. There can be no peace so long as hunger and want are found among millions of the working people, and the few who make up the employing class have all the good things of life. Between these two classes a struggle must go on until the workers of the world organize as a class, take possession of the means of production, abolish the wage system, and live in harmony with the earth. Instead of the conservative motto, a fair day's wage for a fair day's work, we must inscribe on our banner the revolutionary watchword. Abolition of the wage system. It is the historic mission of the working class to do away with capitalism. The army of production must be organized, not only for everyday struggle with capitalists, but also to carry on production when capitalism shall have been overthrown. By organizing industrially, we are forming the structure of the new society within the shell of the old. Now that that's out of the way, here's our reading for today. Are Prisons Obsolete? This is a short book that was published in 2003, written by Angela Yvonne Davis. Dr. Davis is an American political activist, philosopher, academic, and author, and professor emerita at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Ideologically a Marxist, she was involved in the founding of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and was a member of the Communist Party USA until 1991, and is currently a member of the Committees for of Correspondence for Democracy and Socialism. She is the author of over 10 books on class, feminism, and the United States prison system. And you can see a photograph of her uh, speaking on the right-hand side of your screen. I don't have a particular stopping point planned for tonight, but I will hopefully get through, at the very least, the first chapter of the book. But as usual, we'll aim for a stream of about one hour. Also, as usual, the text will be on the right-hand side of the screen uh, for you to follow along with, if you would like. And now we begin. Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Davis Introduction Prison Reform or Prison Abolition? <laughs> 
In most parts of the world, it is taken for granted that whoever is convicted of a serious crime will be sent to prison. In some countries, including the United States, where capital punishment has not yet been abolished, a small but significant people are sentenced to death for what are considered especially grave crimes. Many people are familiar with the campaign to abolish the death penalty. In fact, it has already been abolished in most countries. Even the staunchest advocates of capital punishment acknowledge the fact that the death penalty faces serious challenges. Few people find life without the death penalty hot, hot, difficult to imagine. On the other hand, prison is considered an inevitable and permanent feature of our social lives. Most people are quite surprised to hear that the prison abolition movement also has a long history, one that dates back to the historical appearance of the prison as the main form of punishment. In fact, the most natural reaction is to assume that prison activists, even those who consciously refer to themselves as anti-prison activists, are simply trying to ameliorate prison conditions, or perhaps to reform the prison in more fundamental ways. In most circles, prison abolition is simply unthinkable and implausible. Prison abolitionists are dismissed as utopians and idealists whose ideas are at best unrealistic and impracticable, and at worst mystifying and foolish. This is a measure of how difficult it is to envision a social order that does not rely on the threat of sequestering people in dreadful places designed to separate them from their communities and families. The prison is considered so natural that it is extremely hard to imagine life without it. It is my hope that this book will encourage readers to question their own assumptions about the prison. Many people have already reached the conclusion that the death penalty is an outmoded form of punishment that violates basic principles of human rights. It is time, I believe, to encourage similar conversations about the prison. During my own career as an anti-prison activist, I have seen the population of U.S. prisons increase with such rapidity that many people in black, Latino, and Native American communities now have a far greater chance of going to prison than of getting a decent education. When many young people decide to join the military service in order to avoid the, the inevitability of a stint in prison, it should cause us to wonder whether we should not try to introduce better alternatives. The question of whether the prison has become an obsolete institution has become especially urgent in light of the fact that more than 2 million people, out of a world total of 9 million, now inhabit U.S. prisons, jails, youth facilities, and immigrant detention centers. Are we willing to relegate even larger numbers of people from racially oppressed communities to an isolated existence marked by authoritarian regimes? Violence, a disease, and technologies of seclusion that produce severe mental instability? According to a recent study, there may be twice as many people suffering from mental illness who are in jails and prisons than there are in all psychiatric hospitals in the United States combined. When I first became involved in anti-prison activism during the late 1960s, I was astounded to learn that there were then close to 200,000 people in prison. Had anyone told me that in three decades, ten times as many people would be locked away in cages, I would have been absolutely incredulous. I imagine that I would have responded something like this. As racist and undemocratic as this country may be, remember during that period the demands of the civil rights movement had not yet been consolidated, I do not believe that the U.S. government will be able to lock up so many people without producing powerful public resistance. No, this will ne never happen, not unless this country plunges into fascism. That might have been my reaction 30 years ago. The reality is that we were called upon to inaugurate the 21st century by accepting the fact that 2 million people, a group larger than the population of many countries, are living their lives in places like Sing Sing, Leavenworth, San Quentin, and Alderson Federal Reformatory for Women. <laughs> 
The gravity of these numbers becomes even more apparent when we consider that the U.S. population in general is less than 5% of the world's total, whereas more than 20% of the world's combined prison population can be claimed by the United States. In Elliot Curie's words, the prison has become a looming presence in our society to an extent unparalleled in our short in our history or that of any other industrial democracy. Short of major wars, mass incarceration has been the most thoroughly implemented government social program of our time. In thinking about the possible obsolescence of the prison, we should ask how it is that so many people could end up in prison without major debates regarding the efficacy of incarceration. In the drive to produce more prisons and incarcerate even larger numbers of people occurred in the 1980s, during what is known as the Reagan era, politicians argued that tough-on-crime stances, including certain imprisonment and longer sentences, would keep communities free of crime. However, the practice of mass incarceration during that period had little or no effect on official crime rates. In fact, the most obvious pattern was that larger prison populations led not to safer communities, but rather to even larger prison populations. Each new prison spawned yet another new prison, and as the U.S. prison system expanded, so did corporate involvement in construction, provision of goods and services, and use of prison labor. Because of the extent to which prison building and operation began to attract vast amounts of capital, from the construction industry to food and healthcare provision, in a way that recalled the emergence of the military-industrial complex, we began to refer to a prison industrial complex. Consider the case of California, whose landscape has been thoroughly prisonized over the last 20 years. The first state prison in California was San Quentin, which opened in 1852. Folsom, another well-known institution, opened in 1880. When uh, between 1880 and 1933, when a facility for women was opened in Tehachapi, there was not a single new prison constructed. In 1952, the California Institution for Women opened, and Tehachapi became a new prison for men. In all, between 1852 and 1955, nine prisons were constructed in California. Between 1962 and 1965, two camps were established along with the California Rehabilitation Center. Not a single prison opened during the second half of the 60s, nor during the entire decade of the 1970s. However, a massive project of prison construction was initiated in the 1980s, that is, during the years of the Reagan presidency. Nine prisons, including the Northern California Facility for Women, were opened between 1984 and 1989. Recall that it had taken more than a hundred years to build the first nine California prisons. In less than a single decade, the number of California prisons doubled, and during the 1990s, 12 new prisons were opened, including two more for women. In 1995, the Valley State Prison for Women was opened. According to its mission statement, it provides 1,980 women's beds for California's overcrowded prison system. However, in 2002, there were 3,570 prisoners, and the other two women's prisons were equally overcrowded. There are now 33 prisons, 38 camps, 16 communal correctional facilities, and five tiny prisoner mother facilities in California. In 2002, there were 157,979 people incarcerated in these institutions, including approximately 20,000 people whom the state holds for immigration violations. The racial composition of this population is revealing. Latinos, who are now in the majority, account for 35.2%, African Americans 30%, and white prisoners 29.2%. There are now more women in prison in the state of California than there were in the entire country in the early 1970s.
In fact, California can claim the largest women's prison in the world, Valley State Prison for Women, with its more than 3,500 inhabitants. Located in the same town as Valley State, and literally across the street, is the second largest women's prison facility in the world, Central California Women's Facility, whose population in 2002 also hovered around 3,500. If you look at a map of California depicting the location of the 33 state prisons, you will see that the only area that is not heavily populated by prisons is the area north of Sacramento. Still, there are two prisons in the town of Susanville and Pelican Bay, one of the state's notorious supermaximum security prisons, is near the Oregon border. California artist Sandow Burke was inspired by the colonizing of the landscape by prisons to produce a series of 33 landscape paintings of these institutions and their surroundings. These are collected in his book Incarcerated, Visions of California in the 21st Century. I present this brief narrative of the prisonization of the California landscape in order to allow readers to grasp how easy it was to produce a massive system of incarceration with the implicit consent of the public. Why were people so quick to assume that locking away an increasingly large proportion of the U.S. population would help those who live in the free world feel safer and more secure? This question can be formulated in more general terms. Why do prisons tend to make people think that their own rights and liberties are more secure than they would be if prisons did not exist. What other reasons might there have been for the rapidity with which prisons began to colonize the California landscape? Geographer Ruth Gilmore describes the expansion of prisons in California as a geographical solution to socio-economic problems. Her analysis of the prison industrial land uh, comp complex in California, describes these developments as a response to surpluses of capital, land, labor, and state capacity. California's new prisons are sited on devalued rural land, most in fact on formerly irrigated agricultural acres. The state bought land sold by big landowners, and the state assured the small depressed towns, now shadowed by prisons, that the new recession-proof, non-polluting industry would jumpstart local redevelopment. But, as Gilmore points out, neither the jobs nor the more general economic revitalization promised by prisons has occurred. At the same time, this promise of progress helps us to understand why the legislature and California's voters decided to approve the construction of all these new prisons. People wanted to believe that prisons would not only reduce crime, they would also provide jobs and stimulate economic development in out-of-the-way places. At bottom, there was one fundamental question. Why do we take prison for granted? While a relatively small proportion of the population has ever directly experienced life inside prison, this is not true in poor Black and Latino communities. Neither is it true for Native Americans or for certain Asian American communities. But even among those people who must regrettably accept prison sentences, especially young people, as an ordinary dimension of community life, it is hardly acceptable to engage in serious public discussions about prison life or radical alternatives to prison. It is as if prison were an inevitable fact of life, like birth and death. On the whole, people tend to take prisons for granted. It is difficult to imagine life without them. At the same time, there is reluctance to face the realities hidden within them, the fear of thinking about what happens inside them. Thus, the prison is present in our lives, and, at the same time, it is absent from our lives. To think about this simultaneous presence and absence is to begin to acknowledge the part played by ideology in shaping the way we interact with our social surroundings, we take prisons for granted, but are often afraid to face the realities they produce. After all, no one wants to go to prison, because it would be too agonizing to cope with the possibility that anyone, including ourselves, could become a prisoner. We tend to think of the prison as disconnected from our own lives. 
This is even true for some of us, women as well as men, who have already experienced imprisonment. We thus think about imprisonment as a fate reserved for others, a fate reserved for the evildoers, to use a term recently popularized by George W. Bush. Because of the persistent power of racism, criminals and evildoers are, in the collective imagination, fantasized as people of color. The prison, therefore, functions ideologically as an abstract site into which undesirables are deposited, relieving us of the responsibility of thinking about the real issues effect afflicting those communities from which prisoners are drawn in such disproportionate numbers. This is the ideological work that prisons perform, that, that prison performs. It relieves us of the responsibility of seriously engaging with the problems of our society, especially those produced by racism and increasingly global capitalism. What, for example, do we miss if we try to think about prison expansion without addressing larger economic developments? We live in an area of migrating corporations. In order to escape organized labor in this country, and thus higher wages, benefits, and so on, corporations roam the world in search of nations providing cheap labor pools. This corporate migration thus leaves entire communities in shambles. Huge numbers of people lose jobs and prospects for future jobs. Because the economic base of these communities is destroyed, education and other surviving social services are profoundly affected. This process turns the men, women, and children who live in these damaged communities into perfect candidates for prison. In the meantime, corporations associated with the punishment industry reap profits from the system that manages prisoners and acquire a clear stake in the continued growth of prison populations. Put simply, this is the era of the prison industrial complex. The prison has become a black hole into which the detritus of contemporary capitalism is deposited. Mass imprisonment generates profits as it devours social wealth, and thus it tends to reproduce the very conditions that lead people to prison. There are thus real and quite often and often quite complicated connections between the deindustrialization of the economy, a process that reached its peak during the 1980s, and the rise of mass imprisonment, which also began to spiral during the Reagan-Bush era. However, the demand for more prisons was represented to the public in simplistic terms. More prisons were needed because there was more crime. Yet many scholars have demonstrated that, by the time the prison construction boom began, official crime statistics were already falling. Moreover, draconian drug laws were being enacted, and three strikes provisions were on the agendas of many states. In order to understand the proliferation of prisons, prisons and the rise of the prison industrial complex, it might be helpful to think further about the reasons we so easily take prisons for granted. In California, as we have seen, Almost two-thirds of the existing prisons were opened during the 80s and 90s. Why was there no great outcry? Why was there such an obvious level of comfort with the prospect of many new prisons? A partial answer to this question has to do with the way we consume media images of the prison, even as the realities of imprisonment are hidden from almost all who have not had the misfortune of doing time. Cultural critic Gina Dent has pointed out that our sense of familiarity with prison, prison comes in part from representations of prisons in film and other visual media. The history of visuality linked to the prison is also a main reinforcement of the institution of the prison as a naturalized part of our social landscape. The history of film has always been wedded to the representation of incarceration. Thomas Edison's first films, dating back to the 1901 reenactment presented as newsreel execution of Zal Gaz with panorama of Auburn prison, included footage of the darkest recesses of the prison. Thus, the prison is wedded to our experience of visuality, creating also a sense of its permanence as an institution. 
we also have a constant flow of Hollywood prison films. In fact, a genre. Some of the most, most well-known prison films are I Want to Live, Papillon, Papillon, Cool Hand Luke, and Escape from Alcatraz. It also bears mentioning that television programming has become increasingly saturated with images of prisons. Some recent documentaries include the A&E series The Big House, which consists of programs on San Quentin, Alcatraz, Leavenworth, and Alderson Federal Reformatory for Women. The long-running HBO program Oz has managed to persuade many viewers that they know exactly what goes on in male maximum security prisons. But even those who do not consciously decide to watch a documentary or dramatic program on the topic of prisons inevitably consume prison images, whether they choose to or not, by the simple fact of watching movies or TV. It is virtually impossible to avoid consuming images of prison. In 1997, I was myself quite astonished to find that, when I interviewed women in three Cuban prisons, that most of them narrated their prior awareness of prisons, that is, before they were actually incarcerated, as coming from the many Hollywood films they had seen. The prison is one of the most important features of our image environment. This has caused us to take the existence of prisons for granted. The prison has become a key ingredient of our common sense. It is there, all around us. We do not question whether it should exist. It has become as much, so much a part of our lives that it requires a great feat of the imagination to envision life beyond the prison. This is not to dismiss the profound changes that have occurred in the way public conversations about the prison are conducted, Ten years ago, even as the drive to expand the prison system reached its zenith, there were very few critiques of this process available to the public. In fact, most people had no idea about the immensity of this expansion. This was the period during which internal changes, in part through the application of new technologies, led the U.S. prison system in a much more repressive direction. Whereas previous classifications had been confined to low, medium, and maximum security, a new category was invented, that of the super-maximum security prison, or the supermax. The turn toward increased repression in a prison system, distinguished from the beginning of its history by its repressive regimes, caused some journalists, public intellectuals, and progressive agencies to oppose the growing reliance on prisons to solve social problems that are actually exacerbated by mass incarceration. In 1990, the Washington-based Sentencing po Project published a study of U.S. populations in prison and jail, and on parole and probation, which concluded that one in four black men between the ages of 20 and 29 were among these numbers. Five years later, a second study revealed that this percentage had soared to almost one in three, 32.2%. Moreover, more than one in ten Latino men in this same age range were in jail or prison or on probation or parole. The second study also revealed that the group experiencing the greatest increase was black women, whose imprisonment increased by 78%. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, African Americans as a whole now represent the majority of state and federal prisoners, with a total of 803,400 black inmates, 118,600 more than the total number of white inmates. During the late 1990s, major articles on prison expansion appeared in Newsweek, Harper's, Emerge, and Atlantic Monthly. Even Colin Powell raised the question of the rising number of the rising number of black men in prison when he spoke at the 2000 Republican National Convention, which declared George W. Bush its presidential candidate. Over the last few years, the previous absence of critical positions on prison expansion in the political arena has given way to proposals for prison reform. While public discourse has become more flexible, the emphasis is almost inevitably on generating the changes that will produce a better prison system. 
In other words, the increased flexibility that has allowed for critical discussion of the problems associated with the expansion of prisons also restricts this discussion to the question of prison reform. As important as some reforms may be, the elimination of sexual abuse and medical neglect in women's prison, for example, frameworks that rely exclusively on reforms help to produce the stultifying idea that nothing lies beyond the prison. Debates about strategies of decarceration, which should be the focal point of our conversations on the prison crisis, tend to be marginalized when reform takes the center stage. The most immediate question today is how to prevent the further expansion of prison populations and how to bring as many imprisoned women and men as possible back into what prisoners call the free world. How can we move to decriminalize drug use and trade in sexual services? How can we take seriously strategies of restorative rather than ex exclusively punitive justice? Effective alternatives involve both transforming of the techniques for addressing crime and of the social and economic conditions that track so many children from poor communities, especially communities of color, into the juvenile system and then on to prison. The most difficult and urgent challenge today is that of creatively exploring new terrains of justice where the prison no longer serves as our major anchor. Chapter 2. Slavery, Civil Rights, and Abolitionist Perspectives Toward Prison Advocates of incarceration hoped that the penitentiary would rehabilitate its inmates, whereas philosophers perceived a ceaseless state of war between chattel slaves and their masters, criminologists hoped to negotiate a peace treaty of sorts within the prison walls. Yet herein lurked a paradox. If the penitentiary's internal regime resembled that of the plantation so closely that the two were often loosely equated, how could the prison possibly function to rehabilitate criminals? Adam J. Hirsch The prison is not the only institution that has posed complex challenges to the people who have lived with it and have become so inured to its presence that they would not con could not conceive of society without it. Within the history of the United States, the system of slavery immediately comes to mind. Although as early as the American Revolution, anti-slavery advocates promoted the elimination of African bondage, it took almost a century to achieve the abolition of the peculiar institution. White anti-slavery Abolitionists such as John Brown and William Lloyd Garrison were represented in the dominant media of the period as extremists and fanatics. When Frederick Douglass embarked on his career as an anti-slavery orator, white people, even those who were passionate abolitionists, refused to believe that a black slave could display such intelligence. The belief in the permanence of slavery was so widespread that even white abolitionists found it difficult to imagine black people as equals. It took a long and violent civil war in order to legally disestablish the peculiar institution. Even though the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution outlawed involuntary servitude, white supremacy continued to be embraced by vast numbers of people and became deeply inscribed in new institutions. One of these post-slavery institutions was lynching, which was widely accepted for many decades thereafter. Thanks to the work of figures such as Ida B. Wells, an anti-lynching campaign was gradually legitimized during the first half of the 20th century. The NAACP, an organization that continues to conduct legal challenges against discrimination, evolved from these efforts to abolish lynching. Segregation ruled the South until it was outlawed a century after the abolition of slavery. Many people who lived under Jim Crow could not envision a legal system defined by racial equality. 
when the governor of Alabama personally attempted to prevent Arthurine Lucy from enrolling in the University of Alabama, his stance represented the inability to imagine black and white people ever peaceably living and studying together. Segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever are the most well-known words of this politician, who was forced to repudiate them some years later when segregation had proved far more vulnerable than he could have imagined. Although government, corporations, and the dominant media try to represent racism as an unfortunate aberration of the past that has been relegated to the graveyard of U.S. history, it continues to profoundly influence contemporary structures, attitudes, and behaviors. Nevertheless, anyone who would dare to call for the reintroduction of slavery, the organization of lynch mobs, or the reestablishment of legal segregation would be summarily dismissed. But it should be remembered that the ancestors of many of today's most ardent liberals could not have imagined life without slavery, life without lynching, or life without segregation. The 2001 World Conference Against Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerances, held in Durban, South Africa, divulged the immensity of the global task of eliminating racism. There may be many disagreements regarding what counts as racism and what are the, mo the most effective strategies to eliminate it. However, especially with the downfall of the apartheid regime in South Africa, there is a global consensus that racism should not define the future of the planet. I have referred to these historical examples of efforts to dismantle racist institutions because they have considerable relevance to our discussion of prisons and prison abolition. It is true that slavery, lynching, and segregation acquired such a stalwart ideological quality that many, if not most, could not foresee their decline and collapse. Slavery, lynching, and segregation are certainly compelling examples of social institutions that, like the prison, were once considered to be everlasting as the sun. Yet in the case of all three examples, we can point to movements that assumed the radical stance of announcing the obsolescence of these institutions. It may help us gain perspective on the prison if we try to imagine how strange and discomforting the debates about the obsolescence of slavery must have been who took the must have been to those who took the peculiar the peculiar institution for granted and especially to those who reaped direct benefits from this dreadful system of racist exploitation And even though there was widespread resistance among black slaves, there were even some among them who assumed that they and their progeny would be always subjected to the tyranny of slavery. I've introduced three abolition campaigns that were eventually more or less successful to make the point that social circumstances transform and popular attitudes shift, in part in response to organized social movements. But I have also evoked these, these historical campaigns <coughs> because they targeted some expression of racism. U.S. chattel slavery was a system of forced labor that relied on racist ideas and beliefs to justify the relegation of people of African descent to the legal status of property. Lynching was an extra-legal institution that surrendered thousands of African-American lives to the violence of ruthless racist mobs. Under segregation, black people were legally declared second-class citizens, for whom voting, job education, and housing rights were drastically curtailed if they were available at all. What is the relationship between these historical expressions of racism and the role of the prison system today? Exploring such connections may offer us a different perspective on the current state of the punishment industry. If we are already persuaded that racism should not be allowed to define the planet's future, and if we can successfully argue that prisons are racist institutions, 
This may lead us to take seriously the prospect of declaring prisons obsolete. For the moment, I am concentrating on the history of anti-black racism in order to make the point that the prison reveals congealed forms of anti-black racism that operate in clandestine ways. In other words, they are rarely recognized as racist. But there are other racialized histories that have affected the development of the U.S. punishment system as well. The histories of Latinos, Native Americans, and Asian Americans. These racisms also congeal and combine in the prison. Because we are so accustomed to talking about race in terms of black and white, we often fail to recognize and contest expressions of racism that target people of color who are not black. Consider the mass arrests and detention of people of Middle Eastern, South Asian, or Muslim heritage in the aftermath of the September 11, 2001 attacks on the Pentagon and World Trade Center. This leads us to two important questions. Are prisons racist institutions? Is racism so deeply entrenched in the institution of the prison that it is not possible to eliminate one without eliminating the other? These are questions that we should keep in mind as we examine the historical links between U.S. slavery and, early, and the early penitentiary system. The penitentiary, as an institution that simultaneously punished and rehabilitated its inhabitants, was a new system of punishment that first made its appearance in the United States around the time of the American Revolution. This new system was based on the replacement of capital and corporal punishment by incarceration. Imprisonment itself was neither new to the United States nor to the world. But until the creation of this new institution called the penitentiary, it served as a prelude to punishment. People who were to be subjected to some form of corporal punishment were detained in prison until the execution of the punishment. With the penitentiary, incarceration became the punishment itself. As indicated in the designation penitentiary, imprisonment was regarded as rehabilitative, and the penitentiary prison was devised to provide convicts with the conditions for reflecting on their crimes and through penitence, for reshaping their habits and even their souls. Though some anti-slavery advocates spoke out against this new system of punishment during the revolutionary period, penitentiary was generally viewed as a progressive reform linked to the larger campaign for the rights of citizens. In many ways, the penitentiary was a vast improvement over the many forms of capital and corporal punishment inherited from the English. However, the contention that prisoners would refashion themselves if only given the opportunity to reflect and labor in solitude and silence disregarded the impact of authoritarian regimes of living work. Indeed, there were significant similarities between slavery and the penitentiary prison. Historian Adam J. Hirsch has pointed out, one may perceive in the penitentiary many reflections of chattel slavery as it was practiced in the South. Both institutions subordinated their subjects to the will of others. Like Southern slaves, prison inmates followed daily routines specified by their superiors. Both institutions reduced their, basic, uh, reduced their subjects to dependence on others for sh the supply of basic human services such as food and shelter. Both isolated their subjects from the general population by confining them to a fixed habitat, and both frequently coerced their subjects to work, often for longer hours and for less compensation than free laborers. As Hirsch has observed, both institutions employed similar forms of punishment, and prison regulations were, in fact, very similar to the slave codes the laws that deprived enslaved human beings of virtually all rights. Moreover, both prisoners and slaves were considered to have pronounced proclivities to crime. People sentenced into the penitentiary in the North, white and black and alike, white and black alike were popularly represented as having a strong kinship to enslaved black people. 
The ideologies governing slavery were those governing punishments, and those governing punishments were profoundly linked during the earliest period of U.S. history. While free labor could legally be legally sentenced to punish, while free people could be legally sentenced to punishment by hard labor, such a sentence would in no way change the conditions of existence already experienced by slaves. Thus, as Hirsch further reveals, Thomas Jefferson, who supported the sentencing of convicted people to hard labor on road and water projects, also pointed out that he would exclude slaves from this sort of punishment. Since slaves already performed hard labor, sentencing them to penal labor would not mark a difference in their condition. Jefferson suggested banishment to other countries instead. Particularly in the United States, race has always played a central role in constructing presumptions of criminality. After the abolition of slavery, former slave states passed new legislation revising the slave codes in order to regulate the behavior of free blacks in ways similar to those that had existed during slavery. The new black codes prescribed a, proscribed a range of actions, such as vagrancy, absence from work, breach of job contracts, the possession of firearms, and insulting gestures or acts that were criminalized only when the person charged was black. With the passage of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, slavery and involuntary servitude were putatively abolished. However, there was a significant exception. In the wording of the amendment, slavery and involuntary servitude were abolished, except as a punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. According to the Black Codes, there were crimes defined by state law for which only black people could be duly convicted. Thus, former slaves, who had been recently extricated from a condition of hard labor for life, would be legally sentenced to penal servitude. In the immediate aftermath of slavery, the southern states hastened to develop criminal justice systems that could legally restrict the possibilities of freedom for newly released slaves. Black people became the prime targets of a developing convict lease system, referred to by many as a reincarnation of slavery. The Mississippi Black Codes, for example, declared vagrant anyone who was guilty of theft, had run away from a job apparently, was drunk, was wanton in conduct or speech, had neglected job or family, handled money carelessly, and all other idle and disorderly persons. Thus, vagrancy was coded as a black crime one punishable by incarceration and forced labor, sometimes on the very plantations that had previously thrived on slave labor. Mary Ellen Curtin's study of Alabama prisoners during the decades following emancipation discloses that before the 400,000 black slaves in that state were set free, 99% of prisoners in Alabama's penitentiaries were white. As a consequence, the shifts provoked by the institution of the Black Codes within a short period of time, the overwhelming majority of Alabama's convicts were black. She further observes, although the vast majority of Alabama's antebellum prisoners were white, the popular perception was that the South's true criminals were its black slaves. During the 1870s, the growing number of black prisoners in the South further buttressed the belief that African Americans were inherently criminal and, in particular, prone to larceny. In 1883, Frederick Douglass had already written about the South's tendency to impute crime to color. When a particularly egregious crime was committed, he noted, not only was guilty frequently assigned to a black person regardless of the perpetrator's race, but white men sometimes sought to escape punishment by disguising themselves as black. Douglas would later recount one such incident that took place in Granger County, Tennessee, in which a man who appeared to be black was shot while committing a robbery. 
The wounded man, however, was discovered to be a respectable white citizen who had colored his face black. The above example from Douglas demonstrates how whiteness, in the words of legal scholar Cheryl Harris, operates as property. According to Harris, the fact that white identity was possessed as property meant that rights, liberties, and self-identity were affirmed for white people while being denied to black people. The latter's only access to whiteness was through passing. Douglas's comments indicate how this property interest in whiteness was easily reversed in schemes to deny black people their rights to due process. Interestingly, cases similar to the one Douglas discusses above emerged in the United States during the 1990s. In Boston, Charles Stewart murdered his pregnant wife and attempted to blame an anonymous black man. And in Union, South Carolina, Susan Smith killed her children and claimed they had been abducted by a black carjacker. The racialization of crime, a tendency to impute crime to color, to use Frederick Douglass's words, did not wither away as the country became increasingly removed from slavery. Proof that crime continues to be imputed to color resides in the many evocations of racial profiling in our time. That it is possible to be targeted by the police for no other reason than the color of one's skin is not mere speculation. Police departments in major urban areas have admitted the existence of formal procedures designed to maximize the number of African Americans and Latinos arrested, even in the absence of probable cause. In the aftermath of the September 11 attacks, vast numbers of people of Middle Eastern and South Asian heritage were arrested and detained by the police agency known as Immigration and Naturalization Services. The INS is the federal agency that claims the largest number of armed agents, even more than the FBI. During the post-slavery era, as black people were integrated into southern penal systems, and as the penal systems became a system of penal servitude, the punishments associated with slavery became further incorporated into the penal system. Whipping, as Matthew Mancini has observed, was the preeminent form of punishment under slavery, and the lash, along with the chain, became the very emblem of servitude for slaves and prisoners. As indicated above, black people were imprisoned under the laws resembling or assembled in the various black codes of the southern states, which, because they were rearticulations of the slave codes, tended to racialize penalty and link it closely with previous regimes of slavery. The expansion of the convict lease system and the county chain gang meant that the antebellum criminal justice system, which focused far more intensely on black people than whites, defined southern criminal justice largely as a means of controlling black labor. According to Mancini, among the multifarious debilitating legacies of slavery was the conviction that blacks could only labor in certain ways, the way experience had shown them to have labored in the past. In gangs, subjected to constant supervision and under the discipline of the lash. Since these were the require, uh, requisites of slavery and since slaves were blacks, Southern whites almost universally concluded that blacks could not work unless subjected to such intense surveillance and discipline. Scholars who have studied the convict lease system point out that in many respects, convict leasing was far worse than slavery. An insight that can be gleaned from titles such as One Dies, Get Another by Mancini, Worse Than Slavery, David Oshinsky's work on Parchman Prison, and Twice the Work of Free Labor, Alex Lichtenstein's examination of the political economy of convict leasing. Slave owners may have been concerned for the survival of individual slaves, who after all represented significant investments. Convicts, on the other hand, were not leased as individuals, but as a group, and they could be worked literally to death without affecting the profitability of a convict crew. <clears throat> 
According to descriptions by contemporaries, the conditions under which leased convicts and county chain gangs lived were far worse than those under which black people had lived as slaves. The records of Mississippi plantations in the Yazoo Delta during the late 1880s indicate that prisoners ate and slept on bare ground without blankets or mattresses and often without clothes. They were punished for slow hoeing, 10 lashes, sorry planting, 5 lashes, and being light with cotton, 5 lashes. Someone who attempted to escape were whipped till the blood ran down their legs. Others had a metal spur riveted to their feet. Convicts dropped from exhaustion, pneumonia, malaria, frostbite, consumption, sunstroke, dysentery, gunshot wounds, and shackle poisoning. The constant rubbing of chains and leg irons against bare flesh. The appalling treatment to which convicts were subjected under the lease system recapitulated and further extended the regimes of slavery. If, as Adam J. Hirsch contends, the early incarnations of the U.S. penitentiary in the North tended to mirror the institutions of slavery in many important respects, the post-Civil War evolution of the punishment system was in very literal ways the continuation of a slave system which was no longer legal in the free world. The population of convicts, whose racial composition was dramatically transformed by the abolition of slavery, could be subjected to such intense exploitation and to such horrendous modes of punishment precisely because they continued to be perceived as slaves. Historian Mary Ann Curtin has observed that many scholars who have acknowledged the deeply entrenched racism of the post-Civil War structures of punishment in the South have failed to identify the extent to which racism colored common-sense understandings of the circumstances surrounding the wholesale criminalization of black communities. Even anti-racist historians, she contends, do not go far enough in examining the ways in which black people were made into criminals. They point out, and this, she says, is indeed partially true, that in the aftermath of emancipation, large numbers of black people were forced by their new social situation to steal in order to survive. It was the transformation of petty thievery into a felony that relegated substantial numbers of black people into the, to the involuntary servitude legalized by the 13th Amendment. What Curtin suggests is that these charges of theft were frequently fabricated outright. They also served as subterfuge for political revenge. After emancipation, the courtroom became an ideal place to exact racial retribution. In this sense, the work of the criminal justice system was intimately related to the extralegal work of lynching. Alex Lichtenstein, whose study focuses on the role of the convict lease system in forging a new labor force for the South, identifies the lease system, along with the new Jim Crow laws, as the central institution in the development of a racial state. New South capitalists in Georgia and elsewhere were able to use the state to recruit and discipline a convict labor force, and thus were able to develop their state's resources without creating a wage labor force and without undermining planters' control of black labor. In fact, quite the opposite. The penal system could be used as a powerful sanction against rural blacks who challenged the racial order upon which agricultural labor control relied. Lichtenstein discloses, for example, the extent to which the building of Georgia railroads during the 19th century relied on black convict labor. He further reminds us that as we drive down the most favorite street in Atlanta, Peachtree Street, we ride on the backs of convicts. The renowned Peachtree Street and the rest of Atlanta's well-paved roads and modern transportation infrastructure, which helped cement its place as the commercial hub of the modern South, were originally laid by convicts. Lichtenstein's major argument is that the convict lease was not an irrational regression. It was not primarily a throwback to pre-capitalist modes of production. 
Rather, it was a most efficient and most rational deployment of race, racist strategies to swiftly achieve industrialization in the South. In this sense, he argues, convict labor was, in many ways, in the vanguard of the region's first tentative, ambivalent steps toward modernity. Those of us who have had the opportunity to visit 19th century mansions that were originally constructed on slave plantations are rarely content with an aesthetic appraisal of these structures, no matter how beautiful they may be. Sufficient visual imagery of toiling black slaves circulate enough in our environment for us to imagine the brutality that hides just beneath the surface of these wondrous mansions. We have learned how to recognize the role of slave labor, as well as the racism it embodied, but blacked convict labor remains a hidden dimension of our history. It is extremely unsettling to think of modern industrialized urban areas as having been originally produced under the racist labor conditions of penal servitude that are often described by historians as even worse than slavery. I grew up in the city of Birmingham, Alabama. Because of its mines, coal and iron ore, and its steel, steel mills that remained active until the deindustrialization process of the 1980s, it was widely known as the Pittsburgh of the South. The fathers of many of my friends worked in these mines and mills. It is only recently that I have learned that the black miners and steel workers I knew during my childhood inherited their place in Birmingham's industrial development from black convicts forced to do this work under the lease system. As Curtin observes, many ex-prisoners became miners because Alabama used prison labor extensively in its coal mines. By 1888, all of Alabama's able male prisoners were leased to two major mining companies, the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company and Sloss Iron and Steel Company. Little about this, uh, learning about this little acknowledged dimension of black labor history has caused me to reevaluate my own childhood experiences. One of the many ruses racism achieves is the virtual erasure of historical contributions by people of color. Here we have a penal system that was racist in many ways, discriminatory arrests and sentences, conditions of work, modes of punishment, together with the racist erasure of the significant contributions made by black convicts as a result of racist coercion. Just as it is difficult to imagine how much is owed to convicts relegated to penal servitude during the 19th and 20th centuries, we find it difficult today to feel a connection with prisoners who produce a rising number of commodities that we take for granted in our daily lives. In the state of California, public colleges and universities are provided with furniture produced by prisoners, the vast majority of whom are Latino and Black. There are aspects of our history that we need to interrogate and rethink, the recognition of which may help us to adopt more complicated, critical postures toward the present and the future. I have focused on the work of a few scholars whose work urges us to raise questions about the past, present, and future. Curtin, for example, is not, only, is not simply content with offering us the possibility of re-examining the place of mining and steelwork, in the lives of black people in Alabama. She also her, uses her research to urge us to think about the uncanny parallels between the convict lease system in the 19th century and prison privatization in the 21st. In the late 19th century, coal companies wished to keep their skilled prison laborers for as long as they could, leading to denials of short time. Today, a slightly different economic incentive can lead to similar consequences. CCA, Corrections Corporations of America, is paid per prisoner. If the supply dries up or too many are released too early, their profits are affected. Longer prison terms mean greater profits, but the larger point is that the profit motive promotes the expansion of imprisonment. The persistence of prison as the main form of punishment with its racist and sexist dimensions has created this historical continuity between the 19th and early 20th century convict lease system 
and the privatized prison business today. While the convict lease system was legally abolished, its structures of exploitation have re-emerged in the patterns of privatization, and more generally, in the wide-ranging corporatization of punishment that has produced a prison industrial complex. If the prison continues to dominate the landscape of punishment through this century and into the next, what might await coming generations of impoverished African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, and Asian Americans? Given the parallels between the prison and slavery, a productive exercise might consist in speculating about what the present system might look like if slavery or its successor, the convict lease system, had not been abolished. To be sure, I am not suggesting that the abolition of slavery and the lease system has produced an era of equality and justice. On the contrary, racism surreptitiously defines social and economic structures in ways that are difficult to identify and thus are much more damaging. In some states, for example, more than one-third of black men have been labeled felons. In Alabama and Florida, once a felon, always a felon, which entails the loss of status as a rights-bearing citizen. One of the grave consequences of the powerful re reach of the prison was the 2000 selection of George W. Bush as president. If only the black men and women denied the right to vote because of an actual or presumed felony record had been allowed to cast their ballots, Bush would not be in the White House today. And perhaps we would not be dealing with the awful costs of the war on terrorism declared during the first year of his administration. If not for his election, people of Iraq may, might not have suffered death, destruction, and environmental poisoning by U.S. military forces. As appalling as the current political situation may be, imagine what our lives might have become if we were still grappling with the institution of slavery, or the convict lease system, or racial segregation. But we do not have to speculate about living with the consequences of the prison. There is more than enough evidence in the lives of men and women who have been claimed by ever more repressive institutions and who are denied access to their families, their communities, to educational opportunities, to productive and creative work, to physical and mental recreation. And there is even more compelling evidence about the damage wrought by the expansion of the prison system in the schools located in poor communities of color that replicate the structures and regimes of the prison. When children attend schools that place greater value on discipline and security than on knowledge and development, they are attending prep schools for prison. This is the predicament we face today. What might the future hold if the prison system acquires an even greater presence in our society? In the 19th century, Anti-slavery activists insisted that as long as slavery continued, the future of democracy was bleak indeed. In the 21st century, anti-prison activists insist that the fundamental requirement for the revitalization of democracy is the long overdue abolition of the prison system. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. I have no Patreon or anything like that. Instead of giving me or anyone else money, go to IWW.org and join the Industrial Workers of the World, or one of the other organizations that I mentioned at the top of the stream. Remember, a better world is possible, but only if we have the gumption to bring it about. Good night and go fight for the self-emancipation of the working class.